bit about socket programming in C++. First of all, I should note that despite the C++ word in the name of presentation, about 80% of information I'm going to share will be applicable for socket programming in other technologies. So I guess that's enough with, oh yes. And if you have any question during presentation, please feel free to interrupt me and ask it. So I guess that's enough for forward and let's jump to the agenda of presentation. First of all, we will discuss what the socket is, how it looks and how it's working on the high level. The next step is to get some insights on real world use cases of it. A tool won't make a lot of sense without some useful application, doesn't it? After use cases, I want to talk a bit about general steps to work with socket on a software level, discuss possible socket states and pitfalls. Then I prepared a brief overview of the popular socket protocols I was lucky to have experience with. And for dessert, we have links to some useful libraries which will allow you to use sockets in your project with ease and pleasure. The last topic of today's presentation is NAT or network address translation and ways to proper interact with it. Uh, we won't dig super deep in protocol details, OC model and so on. Let's keep our presentation and discussion close to practical area and everyday usage. Sorry. So, socket is one and point of a two-way communication link between the two programs running on the network. Very good point is that um, it works in the same way if application on the same host and remote host in one or different networks. Uh, using socket on the same host is possible due to the loopback network interface, which is useful for IPC or inter-process communication with sockets. Uh, so it means that basically we can have like remote host to remote host, like you and your friend in the same local or global network, or you can create two sockets to bind uh, two parts of your application. So in order to identify which socket is used by a particular application, a socket is bound to a port number so that the system can identify the application that data is desired to be sent to. Port doesn't define which protocol is used by socket. For example, if we use port number 100, it means that it's TCP connection. No, moreover, the application process might have might use the same port for both TCP and UDP protocols. Uh, so uh, I guess it makes sense to add explicit protocol information to the socket in order to uniquely identify it on host machine. Uh, so now we have a picture when the socket sockets are unique on the host, but what if we have two hosts in the same network? For example, like these two hosts definitely have the same uh, the same port numbers and protocols. How we can differentiate it between each other? Uh, so. Usually each host in a network has its address. So we can use address to reach the host. So it may, we can add this address to our socket information. So basically socket has three major parts, local address, local port and the protocol. Address points to exact host inside the network Port allows to determine an instance of socket and application using it. So on presentation, we can see like how address socket address looks like. The first part is AP address inside the network, and the second one is port. Also, uh, we can optionally add like protocol here for uh, for our just if we want to highlight which protocol we are using. 
So basically, in some uh, operational system implementation, as if as far as I know, in Unix socket is just a file on file system which uh, content is populated by operational system on a network adapter events. So, but again, socket implementation is depends on operational system. So now we're good with the socket definition and know what it is. But why do we need sockets? Uh, sockets give really huge amount of options for what to do with it. It allows us to establish connection between two hosts mm -hmm. and interact in a, some way. So basically use cases are limitless. It can be a chat, file sh sharing tool, streaming, multiplayer game, or even a tool for remote PC administration like RTP or TeamViewer. Moreover, for example, TeamViewer is using, using sockets to, to perform, uh, execute its functionality. So except some like use case, user use, use cases for users from a, a software design perspective, the possibility to use peer-to-peer -peer connection allows to reduce a lot on the primary application server since all data transmissions and uh, processing is performed on peers or clients level. So we need less resources for application server and can focus on more uh, business related activities. Also socket mechanism as I mentioned before, is important for in communication between processes. Imagine you have a big software application which consists of uh, several parts, like application itself, some process to uh, handle cr crashes and restart the application in case of this crash, updater which will uh, provide updates for reinstall main application in case of a new versions, and uh, some third party integrations with other applications like, uh, for example, Discord can trigger some event of your application. Uh, and this, all these components are running in a separate, in separate processes. So one of the options to link them together is to use socket, sockets for inter-process communication. Okay. So let's jump to the socket workflow. Here we have a complete flow for a native socket. Some libraries can perform part of steps implicitly or in scope of other calls behind the scene, but this general flow will be preserved. Like you can't create a socket and start listening without binding. Binding will be done at some stage. You Maybe you won't see it, but it should be done. So this model works for connection-oriented protocols like TCP, since we have a server on the one side and the client on the other. Uh, in case of, uh, for example, connectless protocol like UDP, both clients, both hosts are working like clients. So first of all, after we create a socket object, we have to assign it some address and port. It means bind the socket. Uh, usually we have two options for binding. Uh, set, for example, localhost address since and allow system to define proper network address by itself and set some port number. We can set zero as a port number and allow system to give us a random free port if I'm mistaken, usually it gives the less number that possible. But again, it depends on operational system implementation and uh, honestly doesn't make a lot of uh, sense for us to understand the logic behind it. Maybe for some mechanism to predict which port will be occupied next, but I'm not sure about use case of this logic. So, and the second option, we can explicitly set the port number we want to use. Uh, on Windows, for example, I saw some like configuration in a registry that application says something like, I'm using this port, please don't use it. And 
I have this reserve list of the list of ports I want to use as a backup options because sometimes even uh, despite this like warning from application uh, other application for example maybe even test your test application can accidentally use uh, this reserved port so if we both options has its pros and cons in case of automatically assigned port we can be sure that if system has port available we will get it but we don't know a number of this port hopefully we can uh, get the port number after binding binding of the socket so we bind it with a random port number and after it we can read the data from socket itself and get the port configuration like port number but the question is how to share the port with your peer partner if it's not a constant value in case if constant port value uh, there is a risk if user uh, if the port desired port is already in use and we have to do something with it okay so probably like in in case if port is is not available we have to use backup hard-coded port or again ask a system for a random free port and again we have a question how to transmit new port number to our peer usually a separate server is used for this purpose like two hosts want to connect to with each other and we provide some application server which provides infrastructure for connecting we host one asks server to connect to host two uh, server ask host two host b like uh, host a want to connect you please share some of your details host b shares it and receive host a details and after it they can um, establish connection between them so that's it about uh, port selection process uh, and after it in case of a server it should start listening for a new co incoming connection if uh, server process won't uh, listen in case of tcp socket client won't be able to connect and uh, since it's connection oriented protocol we won't be able to transmit any data so after listening for listening routine is started we are waiting if the new connection is incoming uh, system will notify us and uh, call the callback function passed as accept routine so we can easily process the new incoming connection and uh, start and after it we can start uh, data exchange between two hosts um, so from clients routine side everything is much simpler we can create socket and uh, start try to connect to the host all uh, port will be adjusted automatically by the system since we are not listening we are trying to connect so it's time to start our sockets protocols journey we are started from the most popular one tcp or transmission control protocol uh, this protocol provides a reliable ordered and error checked delivery of a stream of bytes between applications running on host via network a tcp is connection oriented it means um, uh, and a connection between clients and server is established before any data can be sent so it means first we have to connect our host and after it we will send the data uh, no other order is possible the server must be listening for connection request uh, from clients before a connection is established so it's the listen step we were talking about on the previous slide so there is a three steps handshake required to establish connection between uh, hosts so 
synchronization message from client acknowledge about this synchronization from server and the final acknowledge from cl client. So three messages, and I will tell even more. We have we can have some additional handshakes in order to establish transport level security, uh, which is also required. We will talk a bit later about this handshake and is it good or not. So uh, data received from a TCP socket is always consistent since there is an error check and retransmission mechanism on the protocol side. Uh, retransmission is a process of automatically resending of packets which have been either damaged or lost. For proper functioning of this mechanism, uh, the receiver has to notify the sender about successful data transmission with acknowledgement field flag or uh, egg, oh, oops, or egg signal, egg flag. Hopefully, it's not a strict requirement that this flag should be uh, sent in the separate message. So we can send it as a part of uh, response, which so which is some sort of optimization. Like we use one message for two purposes: uh, provide some data in response and uh, notify sender about successfully receiving of the message. Uh, but in some cases, still, we have to pass this flag as a separate message. For example, if there is no outgoing messages from send from receiver, or it was the last message. So basically, we have a protocol which allows us to send data without uh, any losses, corruption or missed part. It seems that we are good with it and why do we need more protocols, more complexity? Let's use TCP and it sounds great. Why not? But nope, there are a few moments here with this protocol. First of all, when we pass in some by set of bytes to send, it's considered as a single stream. Stream can have any size protocol itself under the hood, we'll divide it to portion of data, attach some uh, service information like identif acknowledgement, message identifier, some acknowledgement flag, and so on, and send data to the client. Uh, one socket can have multiple streams. And if TCP detects data loss on or corruption in one of the streams, transmission of all the streams is interrupted until the data is fixed. Uh, this phenomenon is known as head of line blocking. Uh, there is a quite famous example of this issue with HTTP protocol implementation. Uh, we have a website. It has uh, a lot of parts like mark lay layout, uh, markdown, some video and images. We loading it, all the parts are load are separate streams and we are loading it in parallel. And during icon loading, we TCP found some error, like we skipped a frame or something was corrupted. And transmit in parallel transmission for all the streams will be stopped until we fix it. It's not a good scenario. <laughs> we just have quite huge lag. The next question is what if we don't need a reliable connection itself we are fine with data losses since each message isn't connected with the previous one it's not unique and the system is designed to work with data losses and basically ignore it also we have we can have a really huge amount of messages and a reliable protocol basically does not fit with performance for this or overhead for reliable connection is too huge. I sh should say once again that after each successful delivery, we should notify sender about it. And in case if we have 10 messages delivered, we have to notify it sender 10 times. So yes, overhead can be huge. Uh, so 
Yes. In order to solve this issue, we have a different protocol called UDP, and we will discuss it next. So do you have any questions or should I go on a bit faster or slower? Okay, let's think that everything is fine. And here is the real world analogy of how TCP messaging messaging is working. Okay, so UDP, which stands for User Datagram Protocol, is another socket protocol. It has a simple connect connectionless communication model with a minimal of protocol mechanisms. Uh, UDP provides checksum for data integrity and port numbers for addressing different function at the source and de destination of the datagram. UDP does not require connection established. Uh, sender can send data frame to receiver without any uh, preconditions. You basically set the destination address port combination and send the data. And that's it with this protocol. Simple, isn't it? Uh, yes. There is no data stream concept here. So protocol won't create data chunks for you. You have to form portion of data by yourselves. Uh, so uh, the data frame is limited in size. You can't uh, fit any data you want to send. So you should uh, consider some uh, space for, for example, message layout. Are you using JSON, some binary format or protobuf? That's better. So you should consider some space for your message layout and data itself. But there is one big pitfall here. It's simple, but it's not a reliable protocol, which means that there is no guarantee of delivering, ordering, or duplicate protection. We have to handle data losses uh, on the software side and make some additional reliability mechanisms. Uh, due to absence of a reliability mechanism, like in TCP, UDP has higher throughput and performance. Since we basically send message, receive message, send, receive. Um, UDP is suitable for purposes where error checking and correction are either not necessary or are performed in the application side. UDP avoids the overhead of such processing on the protocol stack. Good example of UDP usage are online games. Players produce a lot of similar events and it's not a big deal if we will miss uh, some of them. Anyway, we can uh, match the game state with the next event. So uh, we can restore uh, our system state from package loss quite fast. Also, there are some custom protocol implementation on top of UDP, which provides some error checking mechanism. If I'm not mistaken, there was some implementation called reliable UDP, which has a package loss mechanism of transmission lost packages. But I'm not sure of its current destiny. Uh, and we will talk about very similar protocol a bit later. So, and here are a few pictures about workflow with UDP and its comparison with TCP. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, the first page is uh, the real pain of working with UDP. Okay, let's move on. The next protocol in our list is ICMP protocol. It's Internet Control Message Protocol, a supporting protocol in the Internet Protocol suite. It won't carry any data, additional data if you want to send it. It's only to pass some signals. It's used by network devices, including routers, to send error message and operational information. ICMP, diff as I mentioned before, the main difference between ICMP and, for example, transport protocols such as TCP or UDP is that we want it, it won't take any data with it, and it's not suitable for exchange the data between system. And it's also not a regular protocol you can see in uh, user and user network applications. 
uh, but still we can find some very good uses for it there are a few good tasks which can be sorted with this algorithm with this protocol first of all it ping the host we if we have some ip address and we want to check is it reachable or not we can use icmp protocol it's lightweight no overhead for some data transmission just uh, purely check whether it's accessible from our side or not the second uh, use case is report problems send some error codes uh, i guess this functionality is utilized by routers and we can do it uh, from software side too and we can get some information regarding uh, internet addresses since uh, icmp works on top of ip protocol inside oc model uh, it carries information about internet address and uh, we can use it so it looks also very simple and yes we have pitfall and another pitfall here and the pitfall is pretty huge and unfortunately we can't solve it from software side uh, i will describe you the case from my practice i had a task to detect uh, if the host was on the same network or not i mean on the same local network um, so i have i had a, a private address inside the network of the host and i need to somehow check should I use this private address to connect or I need uh, to get private public address and work uh, with it. So I made an implementation with ICMP of a mechanism very similar to ping tool. Since ping tool uses ICMP to ping uh, remote host. Uh, but simplified without any delay checks only like first freight first package arrived to the destination host it's reachable okay uh, we terminate our uh, discovery process uh, everything's fine uh, and everything was fine with this implementation until some pc in the local network was defined as uh, not reachable without any visual issue like from software side, everything is working. This PC has access to the internet. It's inside the network because I see the Ethernet cable plugged in and I see that we are using the same router. Oops, uh, not good, not good. Uh, but the common trait of these hosts was the presence of antivirus. And what is the most funny is that this antivirus blocked all the incoming and outcoming ICMP traffic. So the primary ICMP protocol issue is that some network configuration uh, can disable host from receiving and sending any ICMP traffic. So basically uh, your ICMP detection mechanism will be blind to this host. Um, primary uh, concern, concern regarding such a behavior from security specialist side is that ICMP is quite poorly implemented and there are a lot of backdoors and uh, issues related to uh, abusing uh, these backdoors. So it's considered that it's better to uh, disable it and increase the security and but anyway it limit this restriction limits us from usage of some handy tools like pin but okay it's we i'm not sure that we can do a lot of our about it if you're interested you can uh, check on your own about, about more concrete secure issues related to icmp uh, so in order to bypass this issue, I used TCP protocol, just set low timeout time. And if connection was not established due to timeout, it means that host is reachable. And there is another error mean error code, which means that host is not reachable. So basically uh, the same functionality, but with a different protocol. So, and the last protocol in our list for today 
and the newest one is Quick Protocol. Quick is a general purpose transport layer network protocol initially designed at Google. Quick aims to be close in a workflow to a TCP connection, but with much reduced latency. Uh, Google made two enhancement uh, for this protocol in order to be better than TCP. Uh, first of all, greatly reduced overhead during connection stop. As I mentioned before, TCP has uh, three-step handshake to establish TCP connection itself. Moreover, uh, we have TLS handshakes, so it's pretty lengthy process. But Quick makes it much faster because all the required data is included in the first quick message. The second change is to use UDP rather than TCP as the basic protocol, which does not include loss recovery. So it's implemented on a software level and this implementation is much more efficient. And the cornerstone here is that instead of, for example, as I talk, mentioned before, if TCP, one of the TCP streams is damaged, uh, transmission on the all other streams will be interrupted to, uh, instead, each quick stream is separately flow controlled and lost data is retransmitted at the level of quick and if error is occurred in one stream the protocol stack will keep working with other streams but retransmit data only to damage stream independently so basically we have much better performance because any data loss won't block um, other streams from receiving the data. Uh, so basically, basically, uh, this here we just have like quite old protocol which will was created on the beginning of the internet and the latest protocol which create which was created with the some ideas in mind regarding how internet should work because. Uh, for example, maybe 30 years ago, it was good idea that we will stop transmitting all the data if we have an error, maybe something wrong with uh, network and we should postpone our data transmission. But current reality shows that it's it was a bad idea and we need something different. And Quick tries to solve all this issue. Uh, other characteristics of Quick protocol is quite similar with TCP. It's also connection oriented, but and you can pass bytes to the socket and it will handle everything related to fuzzy delivery. Uh, primary difference of UDP and Quick is that Quick provides some TCP features like automatic retransmission. Um, so from my experience, I had a case when uh, I need to make remote control system, something like a team viewer. And of course, the most challenging part was protocol selection. How to transmit the picture with the maximum frame, frame rate and quality. Picture was, of course, encoded to save traffic, but I had to choose between TCP and UDP. With TCP, I had quite reliable connection, but uh, amount of frames per second wasn't sufficient at all. The picture with UDP was much better, but yeah, one one frame is missed, and oops, I need to resend it. And uh, resend message is also missed, and I resend, I have to resend the resend message. <laughs> uh, not a funny case at all. Uh, and uh, I spotted that there is a protocol on top of UDP, a new protocol on top of UDP called Quick and. At the time, it was in a draft stage, so it's ready to use. There is uh, some libraries. There are some libraries with implementation of this protocol, but it's still not officially released. Why not? Let's give it a try. I tried it, and I was surprised with 
the easy how easy it's i can use it and the quite huge performance of course it's a bit slower than udp due to retransmission some integrity checks but still it was much faster than tcp if for example we rep since it's super similar to uh, tcp uh, as far as i know it's planned to use this um, uh, quick protocol as a bare bone for http version 3.3 uh, protocol so i'm waiting for it i hope it will be a really huge performance increase so here we have a comparison of connection establishment for tcp and quick as you can see uh, first we have a tcp handshake after it we, we set up transport layer security and in, in in case of tcp it's two separate uh, handshakes in case of quick we do it simultaneously just in parallel so that's why we have better performance starting from the connection itself so here we have a brief overview of socket libraries in c++ uh, the first in our list is native apis each operational system has some socket apis so and it's always good choice uh, since it's a stable, always available, no third-party dependencies, and security risk related to it. Moreover, usually native APIs are quite secured, and if there is some security issue in native API itself, uh, I bet about 90% of libraries will have the same security issues, because usually uh, libraries are wrappers around native APIs. So but unfortunately uh, it, every native api is platform dependent and usage can be a bit difficult since there is a need to implement quite a lot of intra infrastructure stuff to use sockets comfortably uh, so cons are quite significant in the modern modern world software development so it may be better in the most cases to use a good library wrapper around the native implementation so the next library i want to mention is azio or boost or its boost variant as for me it's a great library to start with since it's header only provides very similar to native api and possible and gives possibility to work uh, in both synchronous synchronous and asynchronous modes also you can always get native socket uh, from the library wrapper and work with it or vice versa you have your native socket created with some specific flags or parameters uh, and you can wrap it with la some library components so it's quite flexible but also the good point is in case of asynchronous flow it provides us some infrastructure for using threads but uh, the number of threads and lifetime of threads is controlled by client there is nothing like library says i want your 10 threads you have to provide me this 10 threads or i want work so it's great uh, but still asynchronous flow can be a bit difficult but yeah uh, i i guess asynchronous flow is everywhere a bit can be a bit difficult so our next candidate is qt it has a lot of fans and haters a lot of application are written with it and of course it has some socket support last time i used it uh, it had tcp and udp sockets which is enough in most cases asynchronous flow is great here because uh, it's integrated with the signal slot model as a disadvantage i see the framework size and licensing also if you have a qt in your application it can be hard to get rid of it due to its design in order to use uh, feature like signal slot model you have to implement object in a certain way uh, so 
uh, it can be very painful to move out from it for your project. So the next candidates are implementation of Quick protocol. Unfortunately, there is no native API to use Quick, uh, so we have to use only some third party solution. The first one is MS Quick, Microsoft implementation of Quick protocol. It's it's written in C, so has good compatibility. And as for me, usage can be a bit messy since you, you have to write a big speech cases to handle uh, protocol messages. Unfortunately, it's the price for C compatible API. In general, uh, the library is good uh, since it has pretty low amount of dependencies and quite straightforward API. Uh, regarding dependencies, it was only open SSL or uh, some Windows component, uh, which uh, is available in the, was available in the latest versions of Windows. Uh, I'm not sure is this component now default for Win with the current with the current supported versions of Windows 10, but I was using OpenSSL and it was fine by me for me. Uh, unfortunately, support for macOS is very questionable. They say like you can compile it, uh, maybe it will work, maybe it won't work. We have not tested, we we are not care about it. So it's up to you uh, to run it on macOS. And as for me, it's huge disadvantage because it's a bit tricky to use this library in cross-platform manner. For example, I want to have client for Windows, macOS, Linux, and here, I, and for macOS, I have to use separate library. Not a very good solution. So the last one in our list is quick library, move fast, is from Facebook. It was one of the first quick implementation together with MS Quick. I had to make a decision between uh, this one and solution from Microsoft. After seeing a really scary amount of the library dependencies on other, of this library dependencies on other Facebook libraries and this Facebook libraries on other third parties, <laughs> I decided to take risk with uh, Microsoft one. Of course, you can give it a try. Maybe these dependencies uh, make a lot of sense and uh, the library is great. Who knows, uh, but uh, um, 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 at the time I was looking at this library, uh, dependencies were really scary and it was really a lot. I'm not sure, maybe they fixed it. Okay. I so, have a question. I have yep. a question. Uh, could you go back to previous? Have you ever tried to link together Boost and Qt library in one project? Does it work? No, I have not tried to link Boost and Qt. Uh, honestly, okay. I haven't. Yes, I will talk a bit about uh, not Boost, but Asia itself. So I had a... Because yes. I had ex experience that uh, I had a project which I had to port from Linux to Windows. And that this project was Qt and Boost, uh, actually many Boost modules. And it was basically very, very difficult to, to, to port it. Because Qt, uh, Qt uh, it's like a monster who hates other libraries. There are so many dependencies from some uh, native libraries that it's almost impossible to, to add. Uh, a library which covers a part of functionality. So uh, that's why I'm asking if you have you ever tried to link together Boost and Qt at one project. But yeah. if you don't, it means that yes, it, it it can be you you haven't tried, so you don't have experience with it. Yeah, hopefully I made uh, Qt application was only UI application. So I used Qt to implement native C++ UI from C++, user interface from C++ side. And I had a separate library with the logic. Uh, this library utilized ASIO, uh, not boost variant, but only ASIO. Uh, since mm. 
I wanted to avoid boost dependency because it's a really huge library and I don't need boot I don't need boost uh, mm -hmm. in, th in this particular scenario. So yes, I can imagine the pain from Qt and boost together. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so the last topic for today is so called NAT or a network address translation. It's a way to map multiple private ad addresses inside a local network to public ones, to public one, uh, before transferring the information into the internet. Uh, private address is the user address inside a local network. Only other users from the same network can connect to the user using this address. Um, so, Public address is an address in global internet space and anyone can access this address. The same is true for ports. After address translation, we also receive some port number, some public port number. Uh, so it seems like it's box inside the box. We have box with clients inside the NAT and we have big box, which called the internet. So like, big box internet and a lot of small boxes covered with SNAP and uh, the clients is under the SNAP. But why do we need NAT? First of all, the primary reason is that amount of IP addresses in the IP version 4 is limited and the number of users is growing. Uh, after the NAT implementation, the issue was partially solved by IP version six protocol, addressing protocol. Uh, just with the NAT, imagine you can have the whole IPv4 space inside one public address. As for me, it sounds great. And what if we will add one more NAT and each private address contains one more IPv4 space. <laughs> so amount of addresses is really huge. Uh, the second reason is additional security. Uh, nobody can access your device via NAT easily, even if your public and private IP, IP is leaked. NAT won't let any incoming connection uh, to you, and that's it. But it, it won't work with the simplest NAT variant, which will pass any data. This NAT type is called full con NAT. So why do we talk about NAT? NAT makes it harder to establish a peer-to-peer -peer connection in different local networks. If you are using public AP address, what client inside the local network should be matched? Also, you can't use, uh, you can't connect with the pr private IP since private IP points to a particular host only inside the local ne network uh, behind the NAT. So it's quite tricky how can we connect through the NAT in case of only one NAT, but what if two peers are behind the NAT? So what to do with NAT if, since it's not funny that it prevents our connection and only local network won't be enough to implement something really interesting. Uh, there are dedicated algorithms to pass NAT. Uh, let's discuss the simplest one, hole punching. In order to allow communication of host behind NAT with the external world, uh, there is a mechanism in NAT which will pass traffic if it's from an external host which was previously communicated by an internal host. Uh, let's consider host A behind NAT and ask, and this host asks public host B for data. Public means that there is no NAT for this host, we can easily reach host B. Uh, NAT uh, will map host A's address port pair with some public port address pair and send a request to B with this mapping. Meanwhile, let's uh, consider, I'm not sure how it's implemented inside, and I guess implementation is different for uh, different versions of NAT, but the request pass was somehow recorded on the NAT side. Usually, uh, according to the internet model, request has a response. So any message from host B 
will be considered as a response uh, and forwarded to host A by the NAT. So you see, we on this picture, like we try to connect to the client tries to connect to server one. And if server one will try to response, yes, NAT will pass this data back to the client. So, and the same works if two hosts are behind the NAT. So they're trying to connect, uh, to send each other a message and the NATs will pass data from uh, several attempts since both hosts made requests to each other and are waiting for response. So NAT should pass it like uh, host A not a knows that uh, host b which is the second not will send uh, some response and uh, the the re the reverse statement is true for and the same statement is true for the host b so data will be passed but from the several attempts because both nuts need to know about each other uh, so basically uh, whole punching technique is applicable for both UDP and TCP traffic. So it means that we can also use the same for quick, which is based on UDP, but it's a bit harder to do with TCP uh, since TCP is connection oriented protocol and we can't say any random data. So our request and fa some fake data but the real connection attempts and we can tr it may require to try to, to establish connection several times in order to pass the up so the next question is how the host uh, will get public address and port pair from each other uh, like uh, it's not a trivial question because uh, host itself is not aware about not and it's not aware about not, and moreover, how we can know its public address and the port which will be assigned uh, in case of any request. And there is no way to send a message to the partner because we are behind the not and the partner is behind the not. Uh, in order to solve this issue, uh, uh, not traversal algorithm are using a separate dedicated server with the public address. So it's basically performs an exchange of public addresses. Uh, because when with the first message to this uh, exchange server, we host hosts, the host's public private addresses are already mapped to public address by NAT. So basically, uh, the server will only see their public address. So it's not a big deal for it to uh, ex perform this ex exchange. Um, you can meet these servers called a stun server. S server. It's a, some sort of protocol. Uh, majority of NAT traversal algorithms are using dedicated servers uh, with public address. So this additional hope is not a drawback of particular hole punching method. Also, there is a different protocol called turn, not stun, but turn. It some sort of combination of stun. And in case if hosts still can't create a connection, it will pass the traffic through it. So basically we have retransmission with, with this server. Unfortunately, it's not a silver bullet and we can't bypass a symmetric NAT with whole punching. There is a protocol like turn or ice dedicated for it, but in case of two symmetric NATs, uh, it's also impossible. And the risk of failure is pretty high. So the only solution in such a case is retran data retransmission with, uh, with the server with public address so here on the picture, you can see the uh, symmetric knot. And the main issue is uh, we use the short, our public stand server in order to receive public a IP and port. 
in case with a symmetric node, uh, the public port and IP will be different for each destination, for each destination host. So a different mapping is used. For example, for server one, we have for the, let's consider that server one is our uh, public available server and server two is the second, uh, our partner's host. So uh, let's consider we have, here we have port uh, one, and if we will try to use the same port, trying to send the message from server two, it won't work because if the client behind symmetric node will send something to server two, uh, it can have different port and even API IP address. So it's quite tricky. And here we have illustration of general hole punch algorithm. So let's start from the host A. Host A says to stun server, it's public available, as you can see, it's public available uh, server without NAT that we want to connect to host B. Uh, host B is listening uh, for incoming connection in host C in the current case, in st stun server. So stun server uh, says host B that uh, host A with public, with this public address want to connect you. So, okay, let's try to perform a connection. So we create an entry in our in host B's host B not that we want that we are trying to connect to this public endpoint, and there is a probability that we will receive a message from this endpoint. And yes, we have to pass you have to pass this message back to host. After it. Uh, we notify stun server about like we tried to connect uh, not entry is in place and if the not is not symmetric we are good after it host b is trying to connect so we create it creates the entry on its not side and since the entry is already in place on on host b side uh, we easily bypass not because this connection attempt is considered as response to the third request. So I guess that's it from my side. Thank you for your attention and your time. Do you have any questions? Yeah, guys, uh, if uh, someone has any question, please unmute and ask or use chat. Thank you. It